Following the events of Bioshock 1, just because you rescued a few little sisters and took out the two knobs battling for control over Rapture, doesn't mean vultures won't descend upon the power vacuum and literally talk crap through the PA system for quite literally the entire game. Sweet God, can someone please shut Sophia Lamb up? Mental breakdowns aside, as Ryan and Fontaine both met their ends at the hands of Jack, who would then go on to escape to the surface and live out the rest of his life, eight years following the events of his escape, Rapture was still alive and not so well. Taking a critical hit from the little sisters being rescued because if you harvested them then you're a complete scrub, Rapture was in even more dire straits concerning the acquisition of Adam. Some were still left over and collecting, but between the splicers remaining a constant ever-present threat and the march of time, little sisters were being taken out faster and faster or just simply aging to the point that they could no longer house and create Adam like they once did. These little sisters that made it to post-puberty would have their bodies drastically altered outside of the standard growth rate of the female homo sapiens, which had its origins rooted in the genetic changes induced by the atom. They would come to be known as Big Sisters. So, in today's episode, we will discuss what ultimately induced these changes, how this affects their meat suits, and what their purpose actually is. I believe the best place to start with the Big Sisters is their actual lore and purpose, which will give us an understanding of the physiological changes they end up acquiring later on. Shortly after Fontaine and Ryan both bit the dust, they would leave Sophia Lamb in control of everything, and with her rapture family, they would basically be the main power of the city at this time. She was able to bring people over to her side while the power struggle was going on by getting in everyone's head about a utopia being formed. But for this to be done, preparations need to be made. Eventually though, an entire wrench was thrown into the plan as Jack rescued the little sisters and then noped out of there, sending a serious blow to this third party that he had no idea even existed. Realizing that she needed a ton more Adam to actually accomplish much of anything towards her utopia idea, she would continue to send the little sisters into Rapture to harvest the Adam from Splicers and the bodies that have fallen. This was successful for a while and the Big Daddies were still in full deployment to the Little Sisters. Which actually if you want a video covering the Big Daddies, then I got you covered because I got one. I'll go ahead and link it at the end, but for now, these Big Daddies were basically hulking behemoths who were quite successful at protecting the Little Sisters as many would go on to continue to age. And this is when the problems would begin to arise. The little girls that were sent out to collect Adam would begin entering puberty quite quickly, seeing as there were already quite a few of them on the cusp of this change anyhow. Once entering puberty, their bodies would no longer be capable of producing the atom rapture required. Accompanying this was also the issue that their minds were beginning to see through the conditioning that was placed upon them when they were younger. Basically, the little sisters were completely brainwashed and would quite literally see rapture as a beautiful, angelic place with its denizens being all higher society. Maybe once rapture used to be that, but now it's a dingy, quasi-inundated ruin with just a bunch of crackheads running around. As the little sisters aged and their brains continued to develop, which if you didn't know, not only is your brain smaller as a child, but also it's quite literally underdeveloped. Being on the other side of brain development age, it's interesting to see how things change. And that's quite literally because connections within the frontal lobe, as well as like pretty much every lobe, but for specifically logical thought, these will be continued to be made as the lobe continues to grow. Anyhow, the same process continued in the little sisters and they began to see through their conditioning as it was broken by the brain growth that they were experiencing as with the growth of their body. This ended up driving many of the pubescent little sisters insane, which in turn made them aggressive. Aside from the actual puberty, there were a whole host of changes is being made to their bodies at this point well outside the normal human biology. The atom their bodies had been subjected to all this time made them have an affinity for it, rather than an adult body being subjected to atom, which in turn would change them irrevocably to their own detriment, subjecting the little sisters to it would have their bodies adapt and incorporate the atom into their bodies fairly readily. This would give them plasmids as part of their coding, but would not induce the changes in cognition as seen with the splicers, which we will discuss this later on, but I believe this has to do with neuroplasticity. With the the little sisters aging out of their ability to obtain the atom needed for Sophia's utopia creation, the children not being born at a quick enough rate to keep the atom flowing in appropriately, all kind of came together and a new idea was hatched. Utilizing the adult little sisters, they would recondition their minds to break them of this insanity and then repacify them, and then subsequently use them for the protective roles much like how the big daddies were used. There would, however, be more requested of them than just to protect the little sisters. Seeing as kids were becoming harder and harder harder to make, likely because of splicing issues affecting reproduction, the Big Sisters would be equipped with a diving suit unlike the Big Daddy suit. Whereas the Big Daddies had bulky, heavy suits that required them to walk across the seafloor or really cause them to walk across the seafloor, the Big Sisters had a much lighter suit which allowed them to swim. This would be highly important for the task that they had to undertake. Big Sisters would be sent out to the coast that bordered the Atlantic Ocean in a bathosphere. They would begin abducting children off the coastlines, much to the dismay of their parents. People would ultimately go into contact the local police 
police, but because it was happening all over the coast in random areas, the link didn't become apparent and nothing was done to prevent it. One man in particular would end up spotting the red glow from the big sister's suit underneath the water and assumed it to be aliens. His daughter would then go on to get got by a big sister, and then he would follow the clues all the way back to Rapture to attempt to bring her home. However, while he was down there, he ended up getting captured by a big sister, and then subsequently turned into a big daddy, ensuring that the last connection of evidence the world may have had was gone. That sucks. Upon snatching up these kids, they immediately get taken to processing where they had the slug grafted into their stomachs so they could continually produce the Adam at a rate which was needed by Sophia. This would go on to stabilize the production of Adam, and the big sisters were then tasked with protecting the new little sisters and would be essentially replacing the big daddies in a lot of respects as the new thing to fear in Rapture. So with the history and creation wrapped up, I think the first place we should start is with Eleanor as she gives us a clear indicator as to what these big sisters look like. While big daddies were essentially mutated in a barely recognizable blob who then went on to take the form of their suits, big sisters are still in their standard human morphological form. They're not grotesquely mutated and instead really are just a person in a diving suit. They undergo their standard puberty changes and with some enhancements due to their bodies being subjected to Adam their entire lives. Concerning these changes, let's take a look at the physical changes that we can see and then discuss internally what has happened to cause these. On the outside, we see that they stand eye to eye with big daddies and this would put them well over the average height of any human, whether it be male or female. Standing at roughly 6 feet 10 inches or 2 meters tall, they are quite literally as tall as Master Chief without his armor. However, as the bone growth continued, there would be a stark difference between the big daddies and the big sister, and this would be the muscle mass. The big daddy is a lot like a brute splicer seen in Bioshock 2. Because of the transformation process and the atoms they were exposed to as their height increased, the muscle mass would take on an almost proportionate growth level as well, likely due to the testosterone that was already in their bodies. I say almost proportionate because, well, look at this thing though, I mean it's not really proportionate at all. Anyhow, this is why the big daddies appear to be hulking behemoths, because in reality, they are. The big sisters, however, never develop this muscle mass. As the bones lengthen in the little sisters during puberty, as is natural to do, the naturally occurring hormones in the bodies appear to have been hit in some areas, but not in others. Something like testosterone, which could increase muscle mass, appears to not have been overhauled quite like the other hormones an area of the brain would have. This resulted in muscle being stretched rather than grown at any high rate, as seen with the big daddies. And this comes down to something as simple as the concept as sexual dimorphism. So what is sexual dimorphism? Well, in mammals, it's seen quite readily because we are mammals and it's the most obvious to us. But sexual dimorphism is seen in many different animals on the planet as well as it can be seen in plants. It just comes down to the differences between males and females. With specifically humans, males have thicker bones, thicker skin, and more muscle mass. Males typically have a larger trachea and branching bronchi with about 30% greater lung volume per body mass. And on average, males have larger hearts, 10% higher red blood cell count, higher hemoglobin, hence greater oxygen carrying capacity. They can also have higher circulating clotting factors like vitamin K, prothrombin, and platelets. These differences lead to faster healing of wounds and higher peripheral pain tolerance. This is likely because this was a trait inherited due to male competition for mates. The male that could survive a fight because of these traits and also possibly win that fight was more likely to pass along his genes to the next generation. Females typically have more white blood cells stored and circulating, more granulocytes and B and T lymphocytes. Additionally, they produce more antibodies at a faster rate than males. Hence, they develop fewer infectious diseases and succumb for shorter periods. Ethologists argue actually that females interacting with other females and multiple offspring in social groups have experienced such traits as a selective advantage. With this, they also have different angles of their pelvis than their male counterparts, which can change their stance when standing, running, or walking. Less testosterone also leads to things like less muscle mass overall and less bone mass. But because of this, women typically have a lighter frame than males do, which is where we see the largest differences between big daddies and big sisters. So with all that said, it, it sounded like basically some medicine commercial, but what exactly is going on within their bodies of the big sister as they change though? Well, let's get into that because how bones aren't snapping left, right, and center is beyond me. Well, actually it's not beyond me. We'll talk about it. But when a child enters puberty, many portions of their body begin signaling that things are about to change. The pituitary gland within the brain is about to start popping off like it's never done before. So just for your own information, because it's fun, your pituitary gland is actually a pea-sized endocrine gland at the base of your brain, behind the bridge of your nose, and directly below your hypothalamus. So now there are quite a few hormones that this gland produces, but we will stick with just a basic few, as it can get pretty complicated extremely quickly. Just know that there are tons more hormones that I'm actually talking about being released, but the one in particular interest is actually the human growth hormone, or sometimes it's just called a growth hormone. Anyhow, this hormone does exactly what it sounds like it would do, inspire growth in the body. On each 
of the long bones and in the middle are what are called growth plates or epiphyseal plates. These are discs of cartilage that continue to expand as you go through puberty. In females, these stop expanding at around 13 to 15 years old, and in males, it stops around 15 to 17 years old. And this is why when you are going through puberty, your legs may have hurt from growing pains as it's literally spreading your long bones apart and it pushes them upwards and downwards and all that good stuff. Now, naturally, the age range given is one that you can expect that this is going to stop with the big sisters, this is clearly not the case. Seeing as they stand at almost seven feet tall, this process would have likely continued through their entire puberty and may still be an ongoing process. Usually what happens in these cartilage plates is that they will fuse into osseous bone after puberty, which keeps you at the height that you currently are, but clearly something needed to change different. This goes back to the brain and neuroplasticity. Given the differences that we see between how big daddy splicers and big sisters act, the brain is heavily influenced by the addition of Adam. For an adult to take in Adam, this would ultimately cause brain damage to a degree, which I also have a video discussing the effects of Adam. But this brain damage in adulthood would not be really able to be rectified, like your body couldn't repair it. As you grow in age, your brain has a more difficult time dealing with any issues that arise on a neurological level. Should an area be damaged, then it's likely the older you are, well it's not really likely, it just is, the older you are, the greater chance that area of damage is really damaged for the rest of your life, which can have impacts on other facets of your life. When you are younger though, neuroplasticity is still very much so active. There have been instances where children have had either like an entire lobe of their brain removed or had an issue where lesions appeared all over the brain due to an infection, but after the initial downturn in mental ability, they have the ability to recover to near normal or normal levels of mental function. This is because the brain is still quite adaptive the younger a person is. New connections are more readily formed because the brain itself is still forming. Once the brain has reached a time frame where it isn't developing, which just so we're all aware, now the old way of thinking was that the brain stopped developing in its mid-20s, but now they're saying it's your 40s. But it definitely slows down in your 20s. But this makes it more difficult for the brain to adapt to changing circumstances. While the big daddies and splicers have their brains altered and somewhat destroyed, resulting in the brain damage that we have seen, the fact that the big sisters were exposed to Adam when they were children would mean that their brains were able to adapt to the changes induced by the Adam. However, because their mental cognition was not as heavily affected, seeing as Eleanor appears to basically just be a normal person in terms of communication and demeanor does not mean areas of the brain haven't been changed that would result in physical changes. For instance, these changes in the brain, such as what we have seen with the telekinesis Eleanor possesses, means that, much like any other plasmid user, the changes to the brain were still quite present. But rather than drive her completely insane or any of the other big sisters, their brains were capable of course correcting despite the alterations coming from a natural side effect. The pituitary gland, being a gland, reacts to chemical messengers and then sends out hormones. Should this area be changed or altered by anything, this can have profound impacts on the body. Should say a tumor develop on this gland, this can actually restart the growth process even in adulthood, making a person taller and changing facial structures as the bones continue to grow due to the now increased levels of human growth hormones circulating in the body. And this is what I believe happened to the big sisters. During puberty, as the glands released HGH, the levels were likely to be higher because of the atom damage to the pituitary gland. On top of this, likely it didn't stop for a longer period of time, which means in turn, they would be taller. This unintended consequence of the atom exposure and brain neuroplasticity would have some benefits to the young women who would become big sisters, but likely also had some serious drawbacks based on what we know about human physiology. Because hormones like testosterone were likely not increased based on the muscle mass that we see and where testosterone is actually produced in females, this means that all ligaments, muscles, and tendons are likely being stretched to near maximum. Now, the benefit of this would be able to move faster as everything is almost, say, like a high-tension wire, able to snap back quicker, making big sisters incredibly agile. The draw drawback of this is any damage to the muscles, tendons, ligaments, whatever, could result in a literal severing of that tissue because it is under much more tension and being stretched to the length that it is. The bones are also lengthened by the HGH, but would likely not be as thick as males. We see that in a lot of taller people that the bones are actually suffering from more frailty issues because of the simple physical fact that they are longer, meaning pressure put on them could in turn cause them to snap as they may be thinner towards the middle. But on top of this, the more pressure or any pressure that you put further away from a center point actually causes it to basically be heavier, in which case that's more force applied to that bone. Now, the benefit of these longer bones accompanied with likely more tensile stressors in the legs and arms means that big sisters could cover ground more quickly and could also jump from wall to wall, making them much more of a difficult target to hit. But the weakness in the bones is likely fairly pronounced, and if enough physical trauma was induced, the bones would snap easier than normal because of the physical pressures that they are under. 
under. To help mitigate this issue, however, measures were taken in order to bolster the meat suits that they were working with because of the physical changes. On most of the suits, apart from Eleanor's, who didn't have a full working suit, we see that either sides of the legs, a form of metallic exoskeleton is added. This likely allows for the big sister to use the tensile strength of her muscle, ligaments, and tendons, but upon landing, the pressure of that landing is transferred into the exoskeleton as opposed to their bones, which might end up snapping. So not just the legs, but also the arms were lengthened as they had their growth plates increased as well. This meant that this area, much like the legs, had to be bolstered. We see on each arm of the big sister that a gauntlet has been added, either possessing a spear for ranged attacks or an atom extractor, which the big sister can use on splicers to extract what they need. But speaking of that, what's most interesting is how the atom affects not just the mind, but also the body of the big sister in several ways that are completely different from how it affects adults who have come into contact with this gene altering material. When a person is injured, a certain amount of their cells are either destroyed or exposed when they aren't supposed to be. And this can lead to the death of the body from injury unless the natural healing factor is able to overcome this issue. In the big sisters, this healing factor is more controlled with the addition of Adam, whereas this healing factor in other adults who are then infected with Adam, it's not controlled. It almost appears seemingly random. But with a normal person, they will experience healing to a degree because of how the Adam turns their cells back to a stem cell. But then this can have issues leading to splicers as benign tumors grow all over the body as the tissue is fundamentally changed. With the big sister, upon receiving an injury, she can take in Adam and direct it to an injury fixing it. It would appear that because they were able to do this, their body must have adapted in some way to the actual changes induced by the atom. This would say to me that because of the long-term exposure to Adam and how their bodies grew with it, not only were their changes inspired, but genetically their cells must be able to maintain stable genetic coding in the face of this gene-altering material. And this would mean that the process of reverting back to a stem cell must not be standard with the little sisters and big sisters. Instead, the atom may in a way affect the mitotic path pathways only of their cells, which is supported by the growth of their body overall. Human growth hormone is fantastic, but the cells still need to divide to increase the height that we have seen with the big sisters. Because of this, as more atom later in life is brought in, this will only affect a cell near an injury and then make it divide. So naturally, cells do divide near injuries as chemical messengers alert the rest of the body that an opening has happened, which as you might guess, would be fantastic for microbes to enter through and then infect your body. And this causes the cells in the area to begin dividing quickly to fill in the injury to block out invading microbes. Once it is healed, this process slows down back to normal. When a big sister drains a splicer, it's apparent their bodies have altered to the point that hormones and chemical messengers have changed with this atom, but they can still function. Atom absorbed causes these cells to enter an increased state of mitosis to heal any injury that the body has taken, whether it be internal or external. But this can be overtaxed, however, as the big sisters are far from invincible. So big sisters are ultimately humans whose bodies bodies were still quite capable of adapting due to their age. Whereas adults, when imbibing Adam, would have their meat suits changed initially for the better, these changes would continue, which would distort their naturally occurring mechanisms of communication and growth, as well as their brains in their brain case, and then it just went really bad from there. Little Sisters, on the other hand, had the Adam present throughout their entire lives, or at least most of their lives. Because it immediately didn't take them out, that means that their bodies are able to adapt and were still growing and changing. Adam being present made those changes more pronounced, once they hit puberty, but they were still able to accommodate the alterations and survive in some ways that would make them quicker and more agile than others could keep up with. But likely, it still had several drawbacks to their physical durability. 